just wants to love, a father's love, a mother's love, a love that just rejoices in the act of love itself. It's just, from a human perspective, it's almost unimaginable, as much as we love our kids and grandkids and so forth, it still just goes so far beyond that. Think of the, the deepest love, the, the most lasting love that there is as a parent and a child probably. And God's love for that, for us, is even greater than that. It sees no wrong. I mean, you know, I mean, you see you know, kids and something about when it's yours, you don't see the wrong. You know what I mean? You might see it, but you just ignore it. God doesn't even see it. That's right. He looks at us and he sees perfection. He sees the longing of his heart. Amen. The desire to have a bigger family, to expand that family. Because his love is so great that it knows no bounds. And that's why it's not his will that any should perish, but that all should come to a change of mind about the Heavenly Father. And know him as Abba or Daddy, a loving father. Praise God. Let's give him a big hand clap this morning. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Tim. Thanks, uh, Suzanne and Peter. Good job. We appreciate it. Darlene? church, even though they're clear off in Arizona, in more ways than one, and we really appreciate that, and, and I'll have your check for you, Darlene, at the end of the service. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's the other way around. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. It's great. Young people, children, grandkids, as, yes, as Michael Jackson would say, beat it. <laughs> Sunday school time. Go. Appreciate that. And by the way, uh, 
Caleb and his uh, new bride. Amen. Gabby, you're right back there. We want to give them a big hand. They just <laughs> took the big step a week ago, and we're very proud of them and just want God's blessings on their marriage and Amen. all that he has for you in the Amen. future. Lord bless you. Amen. Great couple. Just think God's got a great plan for their life, and it's going to be exciting to see it unfold. So praise the Lord. Thank the Lord. Amen. You know, the summer's about over, and uh, they had a big uh, paddle sail over at the marina. It was quite an ordeal. Thank you, Tim. <laughs> Well, how about this, uh, James? The flip side of a contagious gun disease is an infectious smile. A smile. A dentist with an alcohol, and you get a gum slinger. Write that down, because I'll use it here. <laughs> Went to the store, they had a battery sale. Dead batteries, free of charge. I should have been upset because my flashlight went dead, but actually I was delighted. Okay, time to move on to the real stuff. Praise God. And all of these are free. That's right. Just download and it's all yours. Amen. Okay, let's go. Uh, let's begin with uh, Hebrews chapter 12, verses 5 through 7, Peter. Ye have forgotten, uh, and ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? Now, all of this is pointing the way really from the natural to the spiritual. We just sang, sang the song. In fact, there's a couple of three of them uh, that we talk about God as Father or Abba. And not, I mean, that's the intimacy. That's the closeness that he wants us to understand that this relationship is with. And so if you endure chastening, God deals with you as sons. And what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? Now, from a natural perspective, we think of that as the spanking, the, you know, that kind of correction. But that's... Jesus took all of that. Any anger from God, any judgment from God, any correction from God is what Jesus received on our behalf. Right? So he's, he's showing us something natural, trying to point us to something supernatural or something spiritual. Right? All right. So look at now. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 12 and uh, verses 15 and 16. We've talked about this scripture before, but I'm going to I want to deal with it in a little bit different context this morning. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled, lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. So that word fornicator there is really talking about intimacy outside of the covenant, or, you know, we'd say in a marriage covenant, but in any covenant, intimacy outside of that, it would be considered fornication scripturally, all right? Deuteronomy chapter 5 Verses 14 and 15. The seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt do no work, thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy maid, manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thine ox, nor thine ass, nor any of thy cattle, nor the stranger that is within thy gates, that thy uh, manservant and thy maidservant may rest as well as thou. And remember that thou wast a servant in the land of Egypt, and that the Lord thy God, and remember thou was a servant, and the Lord thy God brought thee out thence through a mighty hand and by an outstretched arm. Therefore the Lord thy God commanded thee to keep the Sabbath day. So, uh, I threw some of my own words in there because I'm reading faster than I can see. 
But the purpose for the Sabbath was for us to remember, first of all, that we were a servant. Yeah. Amen. In the Old Covenant, you were a servant. In the New Covenant, you're a son. That's right. yeah. Praise the Lord. Yeah. That's just the way it was. So if you're operating under the Old Covenant, you're still operating as a servant. In the New Covenant, we are automatically sons of, and daughters of God, all right? So Galatians chapter 4 and verse 7. We're just going to use two or three scriptures here for a little bit just to keep the context of where we're trying to get to. Amen. Galatians 4 verse 7. Therefore thou art no more a servant. Right? Now if you remember Galatians, he's talking about people that were wanting to go back or thinking about going back to the Old Covenant or back to the law. He said, having begun in the Spirit, why would you now want to go back to the law? Right? So that's, that's the context in which this is being written. He says, wherefore, or because of all that, you're, you're not a servant anymore, but a son. And if you're a son, then you are an heir of God through Christ. Amen? That's powerful. All right? Romans chapter 8 now, verses 14 through 16. Romans 8, 14 through 16. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Now look, back, back just a second. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. The spirit of bondage is the law. All right? So we, we haven't got that. We haven't received that. We've received the spirit of a son or the spirit of bondage against fear, but we have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Verse 16. The spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. All right? 1 John 3 and 1. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us. That we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not. Because it knew him not. So obviously one of the great truths of the New Testament is. We are no longer servants but we're sons. Praise the Lord. Now just what I was talking about kind of randomly here at the beginning. Is exactly what he says here in 1 John. What an incredible quality of love the Father has given us or bestowed upon us. He has sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Our spirit knows. It's the flesh that struggles with this reality of no longer being a servant, but being a son. We have not received the spirit of bondage. That spirit of bondage operates through fear. How many of you in your church experience, in your religious experience, spent more time fearful of your failures or fearful of God's retribution for your failures than you did about the love that God had for you. That's what it does. That's what religion does. It takes you captive or brings you into bondage to fear. Amen. So we're not under the slave masters of Egypt anymore. We've been set free. We've been delivered by the blood of a spotless lamb. We are not simply serving God. We are now heirs of God. We have His DNA, His divine nature attributes, which is what the, uh, I think it's in Peter where he said, we have received, it's by these precious promises that we receive the divine nature, amen, of God. We have His DNA. We have His divine nature attributes, the attributes of God. We have to have it because we're born from God or born from above. We are His offspring. We are His heirs. Amen. We now have a life and not a law. Praise the Lord. This time He's delivering us uh, not from uh, physical bondage, but from spiritual bondage called religion and its taskmaster, which is fear. Jesus came to set us free from having to serve because of the fear of retribution. Now I'm saying some stuff this morning that we know, but I'm, I'm just going to say it flat out. Religion is your enemy. Yes. Yeah. Jesus didn't come to give us a better religion. He came to set us free from religion so that we could have the relationship. 
And we keep mixing this stuff all together and wonder why we don't have the peace that passes understanding or why we don't have the joy of the Lord because we're still somehow being sucked back into the bondage of fear. Amen. Thinking that there's going to be some kind of retribution for the last dumb thing that I did or said. Yes. Praise the Lord. Matthew chapter 2 uh, verses 14 and 15. And again, we've talked about everything. I just saw something this morning. We were talking about the feast uh, and uh, how God, it's, these are the feasts of God. And the implication was that we should keep them, you know, because they're the feasts of God. No, the reason they're the, and they are the feasts of God. If you read the scripture, that's what it says. They weren't the feasts of Israel. They were the feasts of God that Israel participated in. But the point is, those feasts, were the feast of God simply because they were pointing to God. They were talking about God, not about a religion. And once we get the reality or the substance rather than the shadow, we are set free. We're not, we're not trying to... We're, I don't have to go participate in Passover or any of these other feasts. I have the Passover inside of me. I have the Feast of Trumpets. I have the, all of those different feasts that were pointing us to the reality of Jesus, we now have Jesus. We don't need those. Once you get the real deal, I mean, I've got a picture of my wife. But when I'm at home with my wife, I'm not looking at the picture. Right? I mean, that would seem kind of idiotic to begin with. But I got her. I got the real deal. Why do I want the picture? The picture is for when I don't have her. Right? Well, I have. we spent a long time without him. And so he gave us pictures. Something that would point us to Him. But now He's come to us and we've come home to Him and we have the reality. We don't need the pictures anymore. The pictures are actually a distraction. Alright, so when He arose, He took the young child and His mother by night and departed into Egypt. And was there until the death of Herod. Now we know this is after the birth of Jesus. Joseph and Mary, they took Jesus and went to Egypt because they were murdering all of the firstborn. And so they go to Egypt and it says in there, until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled. Right? Which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet saying, out of Egypt have I called my son. Now we, we recognize that Israel was taken out of Egypt, delivered from Egypt, and brought to the promised land. Or brought to the opportunity to enter into the promised land. Well, Jesus is the true Israel. And he is the true promised land. So... That's what I'm saying. That's what he, that's all of, all, all, and it does, there is a thing that says my son will be brought out of Egypt, but also Egypt or Israel coming out of Egypt was just a type of Jesus. It was pointing us to the reality of Jesus. Amen. Now, he's the real Israel. Praise God. The Sabbath was meant to remember how he brought us out. Are you hearing what I'm saying? The Sabbath is simply something that tells us or shows us how He brought us out and brought us to rest. Yes. He delivered us and He delivered us to Himself, the promised land, so that we could rest. Yes. So that we would be more like back in the garden where God was our source, where God would supply all of our needs. Yes. Amen? So He brought us out by the blood of a spotless lamb. And so the deal is, the work is finished. There's, I don't know how many ways you can say it, but it is finished. We've come to a perpetual rest. Amen. Why? Because we dwell in Him. Praise the Lord. Who completely finished the work? Houses we didn't build. Right? Vineyards we didn't plant. That's the, that's the symbolism, but the reality is He is the source. He's providing everything. We can relax and rest. We don't have to earn God's favor. He has freely given it to us because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, if you don't understand that, you're not, you're not born again. <laughs> well, maybe I went too far. <laughs> you may be born again, but you're not going to get one benefit of being born again until you die. Yes. Galatians chapter 4, verses 3 through 7. Galatians 4, uh, 3 through 7. 
to at some point, once and for all, and I'm going to talk about it today. God's going to do this tremendous last day revival. There's going to be a miraculous outpouring of the Holy Ghost and people being saved. Unlike anything that has ever existed, unlike uh, the book of Acts, it's, it's incredible. But in order for that to happen, we've got to get into this new covenant and we've got to operate strictly and solely from that new covenant. Because any mixture is going to hinder the flow of God in the world. In us individually and therefore how it affects anybody else around us. All right. So even so, we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth His Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son in your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Therefore, wherefore, thou art no more a servant, but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. So we were in bondage to the law. Now here's what we need to understand, and I don't think has been spoken of much, and that is we didn't just need redemption from sin. We needed redemption from the law. Because the law is, it magnifies sin. You know what I'm saying? So we needed, we needed more. We, we think about it, well, God just forgave my sins. No, God delivered you from the consequences of the law. He delivered you from being in bondage to the law. He delivered you from fear of the law. He dealt with your sin, amen, and dealt with the law at the same time. We needed redemption as much from legalism or from religion as we did from sin itself. Paul said, I didn't even know, I, I, you know, that I was a... Uh, what, what, was the, what was the one he used? The covetous. He said, I didn't know, I didn't know covetous until I read it in the Bible. And then I saw that I coveted everything. Yeah. And once I learned about it, now I become the biggest coveter around, if that's the word. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 15. And deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. That's the law that he's talking about here. He delivered us, who delivered them through fear of death, and delivered them who, who through fear of death, were all their lifetimes subject to bondage. That's the law that he's talking about. He's speaking about the law. So here's what he's saying. It's easier to get people delivered from sin than it is to get them delivered from religion. Praise the Lord. That's right. That's right. It just is. Romans 8, verse 14. You know how I know it? Because the Gentiles, the reason the Jews didn't get saved is he turned from them to the Gentiles because they rejected him. Why did they reject him? Because they didn't have sin? No, because they had so much religion, they couldn't let go of it. The Gentiles came freely to him. Why? Because they didn't have any religion. They just had a bunch of sin. Sin's not the problem. God took care of that. Religion is the lingering after effect that keeps everybody in bondage. So for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Now think about this. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. All right? The contrast in this verse then is to look to what you were being led by before. The answer is, whether you were a religious person or not, you were being led by rules and regulations from an old covenant. Because everybody out there on the planet who isn't in Christ is judged by the law. Or will be. Because it's the only, the only alternative. It's one or the other. But you can't have both. Now, he says, by the law of the, we live, by the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. All right. Just think about this. I've talked about this before, but just let me bear with me, all right? In Genesis chapter 2, around verse 17, somewhere in there, Adam, he's he's, God tells Adam, you can eat from every tree, but don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. 
because he said, in that day that you eat of that tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will surely die. So what we need to see is that he didn't say to Adam, if you just eat the good on that tree and leave the evil alone, you'll be fine. He said, no, don't eat the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He didn't say, just don't eat the knowledge of evil from that tree. He said, don't eat the fruit, period, of the knowledge of good and evil. Amen? That's what religion teaches. Eat the good, stay away from the evil. Am I wrong? And it's in some manner, that's what they're teaching you constantly. Do the good. You know, avoid the evil. Eat the good fruit. Don't eat the bad fruit. You know what? The good fruit will kill you just as quick as the evil will. It's just more deceptive. You're either saved by grace or you're not saved. So you can think, well, that's good stuff. I mean, it's church. It's religion. But that will kill you quicker, amen, than the sin would. Because the sin you can be delivered from. The religion you've got to let go of. You've got to give it up. You've got to turn from it. And trust only in the goodness and the grace of God. Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 12. He said, there is a way that seemeth right unto man. But the end thereof is the way of death. Which tells me that the natural way we think is religious. Good versus evil. Do enough good, it'll offset the bad. Right? So he said, there is a way which seemeth right unto man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. So there's a way that seems right to man. He didn't say there's a way that seems wrong to a man. The end is still death. Because it's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. There's a way that seems right to me. Doesn't matter what it seems to me. Because if it's the knowledge of good and evil, they have the same result. Yes. He didn't say just, you know, there's a way that seems wrong to man. No, he said there's a way that seems right to man, but it kills him. Yeah. We have to feed on the finished work of Jesus. The finished work of the cross and what he redeemed us from. And it wasn't just sin that he redeemed us from. It was religion. Amen. He redeemed us from the curse of the law. Amen. Religion. Pardon me. That had a 90s flashback. All right. Look at Hebrews 12, uh, 5 through 7. Again, he's pointing the way from the natural to the spiritual. We read this in the beginning. Uh, You've forgotten, have you forgotten the exhortation? Speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If you endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? That's talking about God and Jesus. We are simply in the place of Christ because we are in Christ. So we were chastened. We were corrected. But we, it was done in Christ. That's what he's talking about. He's pointing us to the spiritual aspect of this. All right. So from the natural to the spiritual. Now look at Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 16 with the same understanding. Because we're in the same chapter. This is Paul talking to Hebrews. Who, these really religious people that couldn't let go of their religion. He wanted them to be, I would, he said, I'd give myself if I could get them saved, if I could get them to let go of the law and just trust in the finished work of Jesus. So that's, what, that's who he's talking to and that's the context in which he's speaking. He says, lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. He's saying, going back to the old covenant is fornication. If Christ has set you free, you're free indeed. Why do you want to go back? So he's saying, going back to the old covenant, fornication. The old covenant, listen to what he's saying. The old covenant is selling your birthright. Because your birthright is a son, a daughter of Christ. Your birthright is to be an heir of God. 
And if you go back to the law, if you go back to religion, you're selling your birthright for something far less worthwhile, amen, than the very thing that God just gave you freely. And that's the argument that Paul's trying to make here to these Jews. Your birthright is not to just, you know, uh, keep the law. Your birthright was to be set free from the law so you could be a son instead of a servant. Because as long as you're under the law, you're still a servant. You're not a son. And God cannot deal with you as a son. Am I getting loud? Praise the Lord. I'm just, I mean, this is, this is Bible 101, to be quite frank with you. It's just that we have been so wrapped up in religion that we couldn't see it. There's a veil every time the religion is preached, every time the law is preached, there is a veil that keeps us from being able to see God clearly. Genesis chapter 21 and verse 10. So wherefore she said unto Abram, or Abraham, cast out this bondwoman and her son. For the son of this bondwoman shall not be heir with my son, even with Isaac. Only one of them is getting the birthright, and it's not the one from the bondwoman, or not from the one that's in bondage. Praise the Lord. All right, Galatians chapter 4, and we're going to read several verses here just to bring this into uh, a little clarity. Galatians 4, verse 22 through 31. And again, now Paul's talking about the same thing, and he's talking to these Galatians who were having the issue with having been saved by grace, we're now wanting to go back and practice the law thinking that that would enhance or, or improve their relationship, when in fact it was selling their birthright. It was giving up their birthright and getting nothing. So for it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid, the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh. He that of the free woman was by promise. Which things are an allegory, for these are the two covenants. The one from the Mount Sinai, which gendereth the bondage, which is Agar. So the, uh, the two covenants, the first covenant or the covenant of uh, law was a, an allegory or a connection with your responsibility, your, what you had to do, uh, your servitude, your slavery, right? But this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is and is in bondage with her children. Jerusalem, Israel, children of God. They were in bondage. That's what he's saying. They're, they're no different than Ishmael. Because there's been an opportunity for a new covenant to no longer be servants and now be sons. But they prefer to hang on to the bondage. Now... The difference was Ishmael was the result of human effort. Isaac was the result of a promise from God. And by these precious promises we said earlier, right? We have the DNA of God, his divine nature, his attributes, praise the Lord. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. So now he's making the distinction between the physical and the spiritual. Israel was the physical, natural, I'll say, uh, means to God, man's way to God. Israel from above is Jesus. He's the spiritual Israel. He's the true Israel, what that, all that was pointing to. Amen. And so he says, the Jerusalem which is above is free, which is the mother of us all. She's free, right? That We just read that the, the free mother is the one that gives birth Right? To the promised child, not the bondwoman. The bondwoman was Israel after the law. Am I making sense or am I just going in circles here? So, I mean, here's the point is we've got to understand this because it's the only way you're ever going to get free. You can think that, okay, this religion is a good thing because it's given me knowledge of good. No, there's also the knowledge of evil with it. You're supposed to be innocent and set free. And as long as, there's a balance, as long as there's either one of those, you're still in trouble. You're still being held uh, accountable to some behaviors. Amen. It's written, Rejoice thou barren that bearest not. Break forth and cry. That's Isaiah 54 is a scripture God gave me 
40 years ago, and I had no clue what he was talking about, but this is the whole point of it. He's trying to let, let it, it's written, Rejoice thou barren that bearest not. Break forth and cry, thou that travailest not, for the desolate hath many more children than she which hath a husband. Praise the Lord. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. That's us. But as then, he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit, even so is it now. And I promise you, this message will get me thrown out of about 99.9% .9 of any denomination. I just left before they could kick me out. Praise the Lord. I'm, why? Because... It takes away from the power. It takes away from the manipulative power, the ability to control people and, and, and make it about them instead of about God. I'm not saying the motive isn't right. I'm just saying I don't care what the motive is. The end result is the same death. So nevertheless, what saith the scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son. So he says, don't, don't listen to me. What does the scripture say? Get rid of the bondage. And her son, the son of the bondwoman, shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. Religion is not going to get you free. It's not going to put you in a position where you can receive the promises of God. Where you can get, become as an heir of God. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. Yes. Yes. So Abraham had two sons. One came from a natural seed, which was produced in human strength, human ability, and God said, that's not the son who's going to be the heir. The true son that God gave was Isaac. And Isaac came by promise. It was a supernatural birth. You did not get born into the kingdom of God through a natural birth. You had to be born, again, you had to be born from above. A heavenly birth. Amen? The natural birth did nothing but give you legitimacy on the earth, on the planet. We're in the world, but we're not of the world because we've been born again. Right? Our source now is the spirit realm, not the natural realm. Religion keeps you in the natural realm. It talks to you about spiritual things, but it demands you... To be really good naturally. Say, so, well, you're just saying we can just be complete lunatics and do whatever we want. I'm not really saying that, but what I am saying is if you did that, there's still salvation. There's consequences for your behavior. And it's not God that's punishing. It's the society you live in. It's the rules that we live by. It's the the relationships that we have one with another horizontal yeah. right there's consequences but it isn't God it doesn't change God's opinion it doesn't change because God has said once and for all you have been saved by the blood of Jesus and I don't see you as anything but innocent from now on period Galatians 3.29. And just again and I've talked about this plenty of times but you've got kids you've got grandkids great grandkids they're it, it, it isn't that they don't do wrong. Because they do. But you look at them as innocent. You know what I mean? You're not judging them by a standard of a 21-year-old when they're 5 or 6 or 7. And maybe when they get to be 21, if they're your kid, you still won't judge them by that same standard. There's just more grace, right? That's the point. That's, that's what he's trying to get. There. If you're Christ, then are you Abraham's seed? And heirs according to the promise, which is what we just read about. Amen. How are you an heir? By Not by the bondwoman, but by the promise. We're Abraham's seed. There is a seed of God. There is a true Jerusalem, which we just read about, which is free. It cometh down from heaven. That's the reality. It's not a place. It's a people. Just like Israel coming out of Egypt wasn't, wasn't a... It wasn't a location. It wasn't geography. It was Jesus. The promised land isn't a place. It's a, it's a man. It's, it's, it's Jesus. Grace is not a thing. It's not a doctrine. It's a person. 
Can you see what I'm saying? And everything is trying to get us to come to this understanding. This isn't about your denomination or your religion or any of that anymore. This is about Jesus. And anything other than Jesus is taking away from the reality of what God's trying to reveal to us. Amen. Praise the Lord. This seed of God, this true Jerusalem, which is free, it's, it's a people. It's, that is our birthright. That is our inheritance. Praise the Lord. And here's the deal. We're doing just like Paul said that those early Jewish converts were doing, and that is committing fornication, selling their birthright. And we get this image, you know, in our mind in the 21st century, I guess, that we think, well, they were committing fornication. We're thinking, you know, they had prostitutes or something dancing around in the, in the temple and, and everybody was, you know, doing their thing. That isn't what he was talking about at all. Again, he's pointing us from something natural, which we could immediately understand if you've got a wife or a husband and they go out and commit adultery. That's fornication. That's outside of the covenant of marriage, right? That's all God's trying to use it for. The same thing he does when he says, husbands, love your wives. As Christ loved the church, and then we make it into a doctrine to beat women up and, and keep them suppressed and you know under our thumb. Well, you ain't married to my wife, and I can tell you that ain't gonna work. And I don't know of many women that it would work with, or why it should, because we are all joint heirs. There's no male or female, amen, black, white. A Gentile, Jew, we are all equals in Christ. That's the point. That's the picture here. Well, if you're not in Christ, if you're in a religion, then you're still subject to all this other hocus pocus that goes on. The manipulation. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18. But we all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. How does it happen? By beholding Jesus, not by beholding your religion. That's how you get changed. It happens from the inside out. So we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Now, I may have shared this with you before. I can't remember. I know I preached it before, not this whole message, but this particular thing. But we had the grandkids, uh, yesterday was, uh, <clears throat> we celebrated the youngest granddaughter's birthday, she just turned one. And then today we've got the youngest great-granddaughter's birthday, who just turned one. Go figure, it gets complicated when families get bigger. But anyhow, so I'm thinking about the kids, and, and uh, I, was, I was reading two of them a little Bible story last night before they crashed. And I was thinking about the Lion King. Anybody see the movie Lion King? If you've got kids, or if you're young enough, you've seen it. Or grandkids, probably, would be more likely. But the movie The Lion King, there's this prophet, and it's called Rafiki. And he comes and encounters this lion whose destiny it was to reign. Right? And the lion says to him, My father left me. So I'm just out here in this desert hanging out, eating slimy but satisfying things. And so the prophet takes him to the water, and when he looks into the water, he sees his own reflection, the lion does. And he tells the prophet, my father told me that he would never leave me, but he left me. That's what religion says. Every time you seem to fail, every time you make a mistake, God leaves you. And the truth is, his own word has told us he will never leave us or forsake us. Now listen to what's really happening here. And I, I find it fascinating. It's like the, you know, the, the C.S. Lewis books that all have turned into movies. And there's so much substance there that we kind of let it go. But I think it is seed. It still has an impact on kids. But the prophet told the lion, again, he says, look into the water. And so when he looks into the water, he sees his own reflection. And he said, it's just me. Right? Keep this scripture in your mind. And the prophet said, look within, my son. Look deeper. Look within. And what the Holy Spirit is saying to us is, look deeper. Look within. Quit looking at the thing that you're looking at, just the surface, just your behavior, just your actions, just what you see in the mirror. Look 
further, look deeper into it. And that's where you discover that your father does just live off on some space in heaven. But he lives inside of you. And when you see his reflection in you, you'll roar like a lion. <laughs> like the lion in the tribe of Judah. Amen? You'll leave the desert, the slimy but satisfying things, and you'll return to the rock. You ever see the CD, and he's on the rock looking over? Well, that rock is Christ Jesus. We know he is the foundation of us ruling and reigning in this life. He's what makes us kings and priests. Amen? You return to the rock, to the place that you've been called to rule and reign as a king and a priest in the earth. That is your birthright. Mm -hmm. And we're selling it for a bowl of soup, for slimy stuff that's satisfying but not fulfilling, mm -hmm. not giving us the totality of what God wants us to have. Hebrews chapter 12, again, back to verse 16. Let, lest therefore be any fornicator or profane person as he saw who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. Verse 24 through 29, Peter. And to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. See that you refuse not him that speaketh. For if they escape not who refused him that spake on earth, much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven. Whose voice then shook the earth, but now he hath promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. And this word... Yet once more signifieth the removing of those things that are shaken as of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Praise the Lord. Yeah. Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace, whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. Go back to verse 25, if you will, Peter. We sang a song tonight. It caught my eye or this morning, uh, he's the fire in my veins. Another writer said, it's like fire shut up in my bones. Mm -hmm. Right? See that you refuse not him that speaketh, for if they escape not who refused him that spake on earth, much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven. Now think of this, uh, back to what we were talking about earlier in uh, Hebrews 12. 5 through 7, I think it is, where he says, Now a father chastens the, the, the kids, and if he doesn't, then, you know, you're really not a kid. He goes on to say, you're not even legitimate, right? That's, what, that's the context here, all right? So speaking from heaven is speaking from the viewpoint of the finished work of Christ. Are, are you with me now? Praise the Lord. How it is in Christ. Speaking from a covenant perspective. We are seated with Him in heavenly places. We are no longer independent of Him. We are one with Him. We look into the image of God and gradually, little by little, we are slowly changed into that image from glory to glory as we behold Him. Amen? We are, we're speaking a word that can not only shake the earth, but heaven also. I'm talking about the word of grace. I'm talking about it being finished in Christ. I'm talking about no more religion. Praise the Lord. Now here in the latter part of Hebrews, Hebrews 12 and, and on, he declares what causes the shaking isn't terrorists. It isn't World War IV. Mm -hmm. it, it, it isn't bombs. It isn't wars. It isn't natural disasters. What's shaking is because there is a word that's being released from heaven, and that's what he's talking about, if the word that was released in the earth, the law, shook things up, 
Imagine what a word from heaven would do. There's a word being released from heaven that is shaking everything that can be shaken. That's the day that we're living in. We're seeing things preached today that people would have been for sure kicked out of the church. Uh, you know, excommunicated, called blasphemy, which is exactly what Jesus did and exactly why they accused him of everything that they did. This whole religious system is a system of legalism and it has to be shaken by a word that flows from grace that comes from the very mouth of God. When it does, the result is we have a kingdom which cannot be moved cannot be altered, cannot be changed. I'm telling you guys, this is more than what we've imagined. This isn't just, okay, I'm changing denominations. This isn't I just picked up a new revelation. This is a discarding of everything that was contrary to what God wanted and an opening to embrace everything that God has promised and who we are, the identity of who we are. And I know it's almost become cliche because we hear all the messages, but the truth is Adam lost everything because of what he ate. And he ate based on what he believed. And if you're eating from this based on a wrong assumption, it'll kill you That's right. quicker than fasting will. That's right. Hebrews 12, uh, 28 and 29. See, it's, it's not easy. You know, it's, we think, well, you know, come on, we're free. The truth is, we're still struggling with it. Even when we're free, we're still struggling with it because whenever your guard is down, whenever your grace kind of confession is down, there's little things that come and tell you, uh-oh, you better do some serious repentance. You better get your stuff together. You better get cleaned up here and who knows what. And just think about all these things that we talk about. Oh, there's going to come this catastrophe and that catastrophe. Which, ah, yeah, the Lord's shaking everything. He's shaking it by His own Word. Yeah. Everything that can be shaken will be shaken. Yeah. And it's coming from a voice from heaven that's saying... Your way won't get it. It won't produce what it is you're after. Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably. Because it's the only way you can serve God. You can't serve God acceptably outside of grace. Because then it's you and you're flawed. With reverence and godly fear. Why? For our God is a consuming fire. Well, you think that's almost like a contradiction, isn't it? No, not all fire has to be negative. He baptized us with the Holy Ghost and fire. That's power. That's God power in us. He said, it's like fire shut up in my veins. That's God. We praise the Lord. It's the working of the Holy Ghost that he's talking about. That bears witness with his spirit because it is his spirit. That says we are free. Yes. We are children of God. Our God, who is a consuming fire, He purges our lives. And everybody said, oh yeah, he, He's going to get rid of all the sin. He already got rid of all the sin. What the fire is doing, amen, is purging us, amen, the removing of the whole mosaic system, the temple, amen, the animal sacrifices that could not produce what God could produce. Praise the Lord. Amen. I mean, think about it. Here's, <laughs> it's symbolic. He's talking about it all the time. How did the temple get destroyed? They burned it to the ground. Why? Well, because obviously the Romans hated the Jews because they were rebellious and so on and so forth. But that was just the physical action that took place. The reality was, God said, it's over. 
This sacrificial system, this religious system will not function anymore. It's not going to get you what you want. It won't even give you the, the uh, belief that it could bring you something because I'm going to do away with it. I will burn it to the ground. All right. 2 Peter 3, 10 through 12. I, see, I'm, I'm preaching this, and I know what I'm thinking. I know what I'm saying here. But I also hear what I'm saying here. And as much as I know it's true, there's still a little thing that is, oh, whoa, you're going a little bit too far here. You can't go too far. And I'm not, you know, I... Everybody can do what they want to do. I'm not, you know, putting a gun to your head or threatening you with, de you know, damnation or something. I'm just saying, you're not going to, we're not going to experience what God wanted to bring to this earth unless it's God that does it. Yes. And as long as we think we're going to get better by doing some other stuff, it's going to continue to push back or hold back the appearing of the Lord. Yes. And I, for one, I want to see it. I want to experience it. I want to be a part of it. I want to... I want to embrace it. I don't want to be afraid that I'm going to say something that maybe somebody will take it the wrong way or maybe I just missed it. Hey, I was preaching stuff that was so bogus 25, 30 years ago and believed that it was true. But God opened more doors and more doors. As long as you're willing to, to take the next step, He's willing to give you more information. I'm not saying the stuff I was preaching was sending people to hell, but it surely wasn't bringing them closer to God. It was just taking them deeper into the religious organization that I was a part of. Yeah. And that's what Jesus came to undo. Mm -hmm. He didn't say, I'm coming to tell you that morality is all bad. No. He said the way you're trying to promote it is what's bad. Mm -hmm. As though you could do something about it. Wow. Uh -huh. And we're, having the same, we're fighting the same battle today. Amen. So the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Now, again, we're, these are, this, we're supposed to be led by the Spirit. The Holy Ghost is supposed to be what is witnessing to us, not our intellect. So we read stuff and we read it through a, a, you know, a, a mental kind of filter that he wasn't speaking. He was not talking to your brain. This Bible is written to believers. Now, anybody can pick it up and read it. But unless you have the Spirit of God, it's just a bunch of rules and regulations. It's the Spirit that helps, you to, helps it to open up and show you what it is he's really trying to get across to you. But if you continue to read it from an intellectual point of view, then the spirit is always getting overwhelmed. That's why he says, renew your mind to the word of God. In other words, get your mind to come to, into agreement with what the spirit is really saying here. So the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens shall pass away. Now we're reading this spiritually, right? We're not trying to get a date for the end of the world. I don't, I'm not worried about the end of the world and neither should you be. So the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away the great, with great noise, elements shall melt with fervent heat, the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. The works, the works. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of person ought you to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Well, we already talked about the fire and how God used it to destroy the temple system, the old covenant. Amen. Amen. Consider this. The old heaven and the old earth was the passing away of the old covenant. And the new heaven and the new birth was the coming of the new covenant. Well, you're really grasping for straws. No, I'm telling you, read the Bible. We, we made it about physical stuff, and God was never talking to a physical person. He was talking to your spirit. It's, that's what we connect with. God is a spirit. No man has seen him, and we're trying to, you know, find Jesus in our 
apparel or our looks or whatever it might be. You're never going to find him here. He's the spirit that's in you. And when we look on one another, and Paul said, I see nothing but Christ in him crucified. He wasn't talking about everybody looks like Jesus in here. He's saying everybody in here is Christ. Who they really are. What I really see. All right? All right let me just, for the sake of, because I'm just about done anyway. But look at here. let's look at Psalms. With this in mind, look at Psalms chapter 50, verses 3 through 5. So looking and hasting unto the day of God is going to come. Heavens being on fire will be dissolved. Elements shall melt with fervent heat. <clears throat> Psalms 50, verse 3 through 5. Our God shall come and shall not keep silence. A fire shall devour before him, and it shall be very tempestuous round about him. He shall call to the heavens from above and to the earth that he may judge his people. Gather my saints together unto me, those that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice, by Jesus. Now remember, we said, I already talked about this earlier. He said that this is, you know, what we're, what we're looking at is something spiritual in reality, but we've made it something physical. Now God is speaking by the Spirit, telling us what this fire and everything is all about. Can you go back to three again? Our God shall come. We just read, He's coming as a thief, whatever. Shall come, not... And not keep silence. He's going to shake everything that can be shaken. He's going to send a word from heaven that's going to shake everything in heaven and on earth. Amen. A fire shall devour before him and it shall be very tempestuous round about him. What did the fire do? The literal fire. It burnt down the temple. It did away with the sacrificial religion. There was no way to do it because you didn't have the temple. You didn't have the altar. You didn't have the tools. You They're wanting to rebuild stuff in Israel. You are the temple of God. Amen. People are all focusing in. Oh, well, they're going to try to, they're killing a red heifer. They're going to do that. They're going to rebuild it. For what? Nobody's going to get saved by it. There's only one way to be saved. Jew or Gentile, they've got to come to Jesus. They've got to come to a grace gospel. And God is shouting this thing from heaven by his word. So this is what he's talking about. He shall call to the heavens from above and to the earth that he may judge his people. Gather my saints, saints together unto me, those that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. The sacrifice of Jesus, which is what all those other sacrifices pointed to. All right. Look at verses 15 through 18 now. Same chapter. 50 verses 15 through 18. And I'm just skipping around, not because it isn't relevant, but just for the sake of time. Call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver thee, and thou shalt glorify me. But unto the wicked, God saith, what hast thou to do to declare my statutes, or that thou shouldest take my covenant in thy mouth? Seeing thou hatest instruction, and cast up my words behind thee. When thou sawest a thief, then thou consentest with him, and hast been partaker with adulterers. And that takes us all the way back to Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 16. Fornicators. I know I can get kind of convoluted here, but I think it makes perfect sense to me. What he's talking about is that if there's any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright, he said that that's exactly what these people who are claiming to be preaching my word are doing. They're adulterating my word. They are committing adultery. They're not operating within the confines of the covenant that I've given them. They're going back to the old covenant, which is fornication. Praise the Lord. Since that form, that old form of governing was being dissolved, he said, what manner of life is going to replace it? Since you don't have the law and the legals and all that kind of stuff, what's going to replace it? What, the, life, the life that that represented, what's going to be replaced by this other covenant? What's the life going to look like? One of holiness and godliness. That is the result of full grace and the fruit of Christ living his life through us. That is it. Praise the Lord. Hebrews 12, 16, he says, there, lest, therefore, lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. The mixture of law and grace is a perversion of the gospel. Amen. And a perversion of our birthright. Praise God. 
And we think, just like Israel did, okay, I'm saved by grace, or God saved me, but now I have to prove it by keeping this rule and that rule and this and that and the other, and then telling others to do the same thing. It's blasphemy, it's contrary to the word of God, and it's selling your birthright. It's depriving yourself of your inheritance. And it's deceiving the world that is around us. And so what do we do in exchange? For the true gospel, we come up with interpretations. The book of Revelation is a perfect example, but you can go through anywhere in here. The book of Revelation is just like an extreme version of everything else that's in the Bible. So everything in here, if you don't really understand that you are saved, that it is finished, that you are operating from the DNA of God, then anything and almost everything in here would cause you to be fearful. Because you know you're not going to measure up to it. No matter how much we try to put on, it's, the reality is we just come short. So revelation is nothing more than an extension of that that's trying to give us spiritual truth and we want to take it literal. Which is what we do with the entire Bible. So we see things like, this is, that's the end of the world. We're all going to die. There is no end of the world for us. The world already ended. And was recreated in Christ. We are the new creation. I mean, come on. Read the Bible. We are the new world. We are the new creation. And we're waiting for Jesus to come and He's right here waiting to be revealed. And as long as we keep thinking that we are the evil and the problem and the failure, He isn't being revealed. We are holding back His presence. Who's holding it back? The man of sin. Who's the man of sin? The one who's still operating by the law because he's not under the new covenant. He, the man of sin is the guy who sells his birthright. He's still in sin because there's only one way out of the sin. And that's by the blood of Jesus. The blood of bulls and goats never saved anybody. Never will save anybody. And the, the relationship outside of the marriage of Abraham and Sarah never produced anything but flesh. God did not move in that. It was the promised child that God shows up in. Was Abraham any better I mean, as a human being, when he had relationships with Sarah, than he was when he had the relationship with Hagar. He was the same guy. The difference was the relationship with Sarah was the one that God had chosen to bring the promise. It wasn't based on Abraham. It wasn't based on Sarah, except that they would believe. That was the only requirement. He was as flawed when he and Sarah had relationship that produced the child as he was when he was with Hagar. The difference was he was in the will of God because he was doing what God had promised. He was believing that God was going to do what God said. That, friends, is your religion. If you've got to have a religion, it's simply believing that what God has said is what God's going to do. That's right. Not because of you, most of the time in spite of us. Yes. Amen. Yes. But if thou canst believe, yes. all things are possible. We need to quit trying to scare people with this and quit trying to scare ourselves and start getting happy about what God has done. I mean, this sets you free. That's right. God's done all the, all the damage and all the punishing and all the chastising of His sons and all of the correction of His sons through the one Son whom we all we're in before the foundation of the world. That's what he's talking about. So we're thinking, well, if God isn't giving me cancer, or if I don't get in a car wreck, or if I don't get at least one or two divorces, then God isn't chastising, or God isn't correcting me, and I must be, you know, just out here winging it. No. You can, you can do all of those things, but it'll just be you doing it. It'll just be you making poor choices, making bad decisions, and getting the consequences of it. God's opinion about you never changes. He's not correcting you. He's not the guy that goes out and robs the liquor store. God is not going to, I'm going to chastise this guy so he'll know that he's mine. No. 
That guy was already chastising Jesus. Now the law, the man is going to come and arrest him and put him in jail. It won't be God. God's not even going to say, hey, I know where he is. He's not even going to tell him. I mean, it just is what it is. It's the goodness of God is so good that as humans, unless we're thinking spiritually, we can't believe it. Because you've never known a human like this. You've wanted to. We all thought we married him. <laughs> but you know what they say. Love is blind, but marriage is an eye opener. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Hey, I love my wife. I'm not saying that marriage isn't a good thing. I'm just saying, come on, we know the reality. Right? <laughs> Praise God. God is better than me. Yeah. Sally says, well, <laughs> really, that's a given. He's better than Sally. He's better than anybody and everybody. At our very best, God is still light years beyond and that's what he's trying to get us to understand and you cannot understand that based on a legal demand right marriages don't stay together because the law requires them to stay together if they did there wouldn't be divorce I wouldn't have gone through one or a couple of them as a matter of fact right we, that wouldn't happen you cannot legislate love. You can't legislate morality. You can't legislate goodness. It comes from God. And all the world, laws in the world will not change. We've got more laws today in this country than, it's, than there's ever been in this country. And they're trying to come up with a new one every, every day to get you to be a nicer person or to treat somebody more fairly. It won't happen. It doesn't work that way. If it isn't coming from your heart, if you can't see somebody as a brother or a sister or as a, uh, you know, an individual that is equal and right and, 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 and value, I don't care what law you pass. There will still be some idiot sneaking around with a sniper scope, you know, trying to pop somebody or kill somebody because of his own problems. This has to come from inside, and that's where God is. It comes from us allowing God to be revealed. And it won't happen through legislation. It won't happen no matter what you call the law. It'll just show the failure to keep the law, which is exactly what Paul said. I didn't know anything about coveting until I seen it in the law. Then all I could do was covet. Praise the Lord. We have been set free. And the sooner we get that settled and understood, the sooner we're going to have an appearing of Jesus. The sooner this thing will wrap up and this heaven will invade earth. Amen. And dominate. We are the new creation. We're not waiting for a new heaven and a new earth. We're just waiting for it to be revealed. We're just waiting for somebody, enough somebodies, to wake up to the reality of who they are and what they are and let it be. Praise the Lord. Give the Lord a hand clap. Please. Amen. Jesus was radical. Jesus was so radical that they called him a blasphemer and everything else. Well, he wasn't radical based on what we're talking about today. He was only radical based on the religious mindset that the people had. Because they saw it all as literal instead of spiritual. We, we have the Holy Spirit. There is no excuse for us to be afraid to step out and believe God in an area that we haven't believed in before. Amen. He is the Holy Spirit. He leads and guides us into all truth. If we're so paranoid that I'm going to make a mistake, then I might as well go back to being something else. You know, anything else. Just, just more strict. Just more rigid. And, you know, more legalistic and what have you. It didn't work. It doesn't work. It will never work. It makes hypocrites of people. It makes them liars. It makes them sneak. It makes them just what Tim was talking about earlier and has before. It makes them pull the shades thinking that they're going to get away with something. It isn't God that's being fooled. It's the deacon. You know, it's the pastor. It's the, it's the song leader. It's somebody else that we think we're going to... We're, what, what do we, why do we care? 
They, they got no power over my life or your life or anybody else's life. God's the only one I'm going to answer to. And I've already answered to him 2,000 years ago in Christ. And everything between me and him is good. Right? I mean, if you've got a problem, it isn't between you and God. It's between your two ears. Amen. What you believe. Amen? Okay, I sh I'm, I'm done. Praise God. I'm finished. Amen. Sometimes, you know, you got to just feed like a baby, you know. Speaking of which, you know where baby spoons come from? Think about it. Sporks. You're dismissed in Jesus' name.